Greetings and salutations friends, and welcome back to yet another Warhammer lore video. Today we're going to be talking about one of the um, main focal points of the upcoming Total War Warhammer 2, the Vortex. What it is, what it does, and, well, why it is. So, let's start with the what, shall we? At the very beginning of the Warhammer world, when the Old Ones came to the planet and created the Slans and many of the other various species, the world was completely isolated from the forces of chaos, meaning there was no corruption, there was no magic, there were no unnatural nasty creatures lurking in the darkness. However, the Old Ones did use the warp for many things. For example, they did harness the warp in a way similar to that of the ancient Eldar of 40k, where they could create chaos gods and have them fulfill very specific tasks while maintaining control over them. I've talked about how chaos has worked on multiple occasions. If you haven't watched the video, I have made a video called Chaos Explained. I suggest you go watch that for a more in-depth explanation of how this works. But basically, the Old Ones could create a god and have to fill a very specific purpose. Let's say, for example, that they need to move the continents around to get the proper layout of the place. They could create a god of moving continents. Or hell, they could even just create a god that would give energy to a specific set of magical spells, and therefore they created geomancy and gave the secrets of this magical discipline to their slan mage priests who helped them reshape the Warhammer world. In addition to this, the Old Ones also apparently used the warp for transportation. They created massive warp gates on the northernmost and southernmost polar ice caps of the Warhammer world, which they used to travel back and forth across the galaxy and presumably also bring various resources and other handy things to the Warhammer world, possibly even the Slans themselves. Unfortunately, chaos tends to be a rather moody form of transportation, and a small mishap was inevitable, although it should be mentioned that previous to this little mishap, the warp was nowhere near as tumultuous as it is currently. And indeed, if you believe the idea that the Warhammer world is somewhere within the universe of 40k, then at this point in time the warp was almost completely quiet, because this was the time when the Eldar were creating their gods, specifically to control the warp. However, then Slanesh happened, and all kinds of shit hit the fan at Mach 11. And this massive surge in warp energy caused the gates at the polar ice caps to go BOOM! Spreading chaos all over the world. And this was very, very bad. Because what usually comes with tides of warp energy? That's right, massive amounts of demons which tends to be somewhat detrimental to the local wildlife, and indeed, the vast majority of the unprotected life on the planet was simply just wiped out. The dwarves in their mountain holds barred their doors and could protect themselves to a certain degree against the tides of demonic creatures. The High Elves, with their magic, could also raise wards to fight against the tides of monsters. And the Lizardmen, well, they had kind of been specifically placed there to protect the world against stuff like this, but the sheer numbers was just simply too much. Although in all due probability, the lesser races owe the Lizardmen their very survival, since unsurprisingly, the demons focused on the greatest threat, that being of course the Lizardmen and the Slan Mage Priests, being the only one with any real chance of actually sealing the gates. This was to be their undoing, however. The Lizardmans held them off, and the Slan Mage Priests, under the command of Lord Croak himself, caused a lot of damage to the demonic swarms, which although in all due technicality infinite, since they're connected directly to the warp, still do have a certain limit on just how many bad creatures they can manifest in a given area, especially in areas that are heavily warded by the Lizardman's predecessors, the Old Ones. 
This gave a rather unexpected race the time to actually seal the gate, or, well, in all due technicality, not really seal. You see, the High Elves, although the demons had sent a fair force over to screw with them, had not been considered as high on the threat listing as the Lizardmen. What the pointy-headed demons had forgot to take into account, however, was that the High Elves had also been blessed by some of the Old One's knowledge. Not to the degree that the Lizardmen had been, but they too knew how to forge their own gods. They still considered them as gods rather than tools like the Slan, but they could nevertheless create them, and form them in the images that they considered pleasing, creating beneficial gods, and locking some of their darker impulses in within these celestial entities. One of these gods, the King of the Gods, was Assyrian. This was the mightiest of all of the creations of the High Elves, their Zeus or Odin, and therefore a creature of virtually limitless capabilities. However, within the warp itself, Assyrian was a relatively minor entity compared to the Great Four, and therefore could not really intervene directly, not without a host. When the hordes of demons rolled across the kingdoms of Ulthuan, it became blindingly obvious that the separate kingdoms of the High Elves could not stand against the tide. A young hero sacrificed himself willingly to Assyrian, walking through the phoenix flames in his shrine. But miraculously, the young hero emerged unscathed and infused with the power of Assyrian, making him one of the most powerful mortals in the Warhammer world at the time. But this alone was not quite enough to turn back the tides of demons. For that, a little extra was required. A little... spice. As such, the young hero, known as Enirion, travelled to what is now known as the Blighted Isles, where the Sword of Cain, the Eldar God of War, was embedded within a stone. Enirion drew the sword from the stone and was infused by the power of the God of War, Death, Murder, Suffering, Blood and everything else just nice and horrible. This gave him the power he needed to defeat the demonic tides, although it also, in all due essentiality, sucked the soul from the conquering hero. A lesser elf would undoubtedly have been killed before he could even draw the sword from the stone, but Anarion managed to retain control of the weapon for just long enough to buy time for the second hero of this story to complete his ritual. The second hero was Kalidor Dragon Tamer, and this is where the dragons come into the picture. The Sword of Cain was forged to be a living conduit between the God of War and the High Elves, but as you can probably imagine, a living conduit between a god whose only purpose is violent murder and butt rape is a thing that comes at a rather steep cost. The sword was sent to be forged in the fires of the Father of Dragons. However, even such a mighty sacrifice was not enough to bind the sword permanently, and the sword took considerably more from the Father of Dragons than what was offered, taking much of his life force along with his actual offerings of fire. This bound the dragons forevermore to the High Elves, in a sort of slave-like contract, though do bear in mind the dragons do still have a fair bit of free will, however, by invoking the contract forged between the Father of Dragons, the High Elves, and that of the God of War, the High Elves could bind the dragons to their service, and the first High Elf to do so was Calador, friend of Anarion forevermore to be known as Calidor the Dragon Tamer, the greatest living High Elf Mage in known history. And it's a damn good thing too that he was pretty good at magic, cause his Betty Anirian was doing damage to the demonic hordes, but he wasn't holding them off, while Lord Croak on the other side of the world were fighting twelve greater demons bare-chested, 
Poor little Anarion could only kill about three before getting himself mortally wounded. So it's a good thing that Kalidor had figured out a magical ritual to suck the magic out of the world. And as you might already know, magic is essentially just another fancy word for the forces of chaos. And this is what eventually led to the creation of the Vortex. Kalidor Dragon Tamer, along with a group of other High Elf mages, along with a little bit of magical backup from the Slans of Lustria, created a magical Vortex via a network of Menahir stones scattered around Ulthwan to draw off the magical energies in the world into the Vortex and send it spewing back into the realms of chaos. The idea was essentially to drain the Warhammer world for so much magic so quickly that the constant stream of chaotic energies, and therefore magics coming out of the shattered gates to the north and the south, would be equalised. As it turned out, it was not quite enough to draw all of the magical power out of the world. But it did create enough of a vacuum to make sure that the Chaos Demons can only live very, very close to the gates. Only during times of high magical activity, when the winds of Chaos blow strong, could the demons venture anywhere beyond their northern and southernmost continents. There was, however, one teensy weensy beensy complication. You see, the ritual was not perfect, and Kalidor Dragon Tamer had severely underestimated the sheer amount of magical energies required to get it off successfully. This meant that he and his mages simply did not have enough power, even during a full-blown chaos invasion, to seal the deal and automate the process. Instead, him and his cabal of mages are now stuck for all eternity reciting the spell until the end of the world. Should they ever falter, then the winds of chaos would once again burst over the world and drown everyone in spiky demons. And just to add insult to injury, the magical forces of the Vortex also ensures that Kalidor Dragon Tamer and his mages cannot die, nor could they ever possibly cease the ritual. Essentially, they are now stuck there for all eternity as living statues, having no influence upon their actions, yet of course being entirely aware of them at all times as they continue to carry out this excruciatingly painful and exhausting ritual. It's, um, it's one of those death would be a relief type scenarios. But what does this actually mean for the old world in general? Well, let's go a little bit back and think about what the Vortex actually is. So, the Vortex is a way for the High Elves to siphon magical energies out of the world and back out into the Void again. Which means that to do this, it has to gather up incredible amounts of magical energies. Essentially, the Vortex is sucking up all of the magical power released by both of the Shattered Gates. This is an absolutely hilarious amount of energy. The same energy was used by the Slans to tear continents apart and move them across the ocean to give you just a tiny little hint of how powerful this force is. This means that if someone were to tap into it, like for example Malekith the Misunderstood, he would have access to a ludicrous amount of magical energies, much more so than what would be required on the battlefield for example. We're not talking about the ability to throw a fireball here, we're talking about abilities to make fiery comets rain down upon entire cities for hours upon end. For the less scrupulous races of the Warhammer world, the Vortex is essentially a gigantic pile of intercontinental nuclear ballistic missiles, just begging to be let loose upon the other races of the Warhammer world. The problem, of course, is that it's not the most stable of spells. As such, while those with a somewhat reckless streak might consider this a weapon to be used, those with considerably more care and, you know, giving a shit about the world staying in one goddamn piece, would be considerably opposed to anyone fucking with the Vortex. And there we have our conflict of interest. 
The Dark Elves will undoubtedly want to screw with the Vortex as much as humanly possible, while the Lizardmen will want to keep their dirty little grubby hands away from it as much as lizardly possible. As for the High Elves, they probably have slightly mixed ambitions. They no doubt want to protect the spell, considering that this is the very spell that keeps Ulthuan floating, but the High Elves also have a nasty little habit of playing with things that they probably shouldn't be playing with. And this goes double for Teclix and his brother Tyrion, who have a particularly nasty habit of doing things that they really, really shouldn't. As such, I wouldn't be at all surprised if they would be just as hostile to the Lizardmen as the Dark Elves, considering that while they do of course want to preserve the Vortex, they will still want to use some of its powers for their own goals, whilst the Lizardmen simply just want to keep everyone away from this ridiculous pile of nuclear weapons. And as for the Skaven, well... They have many, many agendas here. One, blowing up the world might not be that bad of a thing, considering that Skavens have a nasty habit of doing that anyway. Two, we're talking about magic here, which means it could potentially be used by a very small number of Skaven, which is very good, because Skavens have a hard time trusting other Skavens, especially when it comes to giving them control over something that might blow up the entire goddamn continent upon which they are currently residing. And thirdly, the Magical Vortex is taking all of the chaotic energies in the world and sucking into a very, very small confined area, thereby gathering up all of the forces of chaos in one tiny, tiny area. And what happens when this generally occurs? Warpstone. Mountains of fucking Warpstone. And there is nothing the Skaven love quite as much as their shiny green rocks. In short, all of the races involved have plenty of reasons to venture off to Lustre in search of infinite magical energies. As for all of the other races in the Old World, well, while the Vortex will not be present in the big old Grand Campaign map, they would still certainly have interests in playing with it themselves. Infinite magical energies is, after all, not something to be sniffed at. But let's actually talk a little bit about what kind of campaign effects this could actually have in terms of actual gameplay. So, the Vortex, as we've already talked about, is essentially an infinite wellspring of magical energies. And as I also mentioned, this is not the amount of magical energies that would be used to throw fireballs and turn your enemies into sheep or anything. This is the kind of shit that levels cities and wipes armies off the map in giant avalanches and earthquakes where the very ground itself rises up and goes smack on top of them. To really do this justice, whoever really controls the access to the Vortex should essentially be able to just wipe out entire cities, and that's probably why the Vortex is an endgame campaign goal. Basically, whoever gets proper access to it can either choose to seal it off or abuse it for their own ends, and considering the sheer amount of magical energies, it would essentially mean that they would be the only nuclear power in the world, giving them an overwhelming and, to be entirely honest, unassailable advantage over all of the other factions. And by the same coin, if the Lizardmen get access to it and manage to shut it off permanently, all of the other races will probably just go like, well, we tried, time to go back home, because god knows there's nothing fucking interesting in Lustria other than angry Lizardmen. But as for actual campaign effects rather than the end game goal, I would love to see stuff like army-wide buffs or debuffs. Maybe you could cast a palsy spell upon the enemy, a pox, a skaven pox, that would decrease all of their melee defense by, say, 20, for example, for one battle. That is a very powerful effect, but not entirely devastating, you know? You could maybe pull through, but you'd certainly be at a massive disadvantage. There might even be spells that would level entire cities, although I'm wondering if that would be balanceable. Imagine building up a nice big fat city and then having the whole goddamn thing leveled, and by leveled I mean you can't repair it, you'd have to really rebuild the entire goddamn thing. That would probably be a bit too much, but at the same time, just inflicting damage to the various buildings so that you can repair it feels a little bit... lacking in terms of oomph, if you get my drift. One thing I would really like to see, which I don't think would really break the game's balance, is give the Vortex spells that would influence the player personally. 
For example, let's say that there was a spell that could increase your income by a ludicrous amount for like one or two turns. Like you could just blow the horn of wealth and fortune, and your income would increase by like 300% for like one turn, giving you a massive boost of resources. That would be a very, very powerful effect, but it would only affect you. There would be no widespread effects. Granted, it'd be kind of pointless for the AI, because it essentially has infinite money anyway, but in a head versus head multiplayer campaign, it could get really, really interesting. Basically, I would like to see the effects have a very powerful effect, but at the same time not be game-breaking. It's a difficult balance, because you either make them too weak or too powerful. You either make it kinda useless or way, way, way too good. And I think maybe concentrating the effects of the Vortex mostly in buffs and minor debuffs would probably be the best way to go. For example, you could increase all of your unit's armor, or their melee attack, melee defense, etc, stuff like that. That would give you a very powerful effect, without it being game-breaking. At the same time, though, I really want to see meteors raining down upon goddamn cities, because awesome. I do hope that we're going to be seeing some agent videos, you know, the old kind of old style from Medieval 2 and the earlier shoguns, etc, where we'd see a cutscene where just people are going around in the city you know, everything's peaceful and wonderful. Then a giant goddamn hole opens up in the sky and Meteor starts raining out with little fuck you signs written on them. That would be quite wonderful. I am really looking forward to seeing what Creative Assembly are going to do with the Vortex, because it has a lot of potential to be a really, really interesting game mechanic. I'm not a huge fan of the whole make it an end game goal kind of thing, because generally speaking, I'm not a fan of ticking death clocks in grand strategy games, but if it is done correctly, it might not be that big of a deal, or it could be the only deal that matters. We're gonna have to wait and see. Until next time, I have been Arch, thank you very much for listening, and I do hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.